Hi and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to discuss orthogonal bases. We'll start with the basic definitions. I've already said that orthogonal bases are going to be an important tool for computing orthogonal decompositions and also orthogonal projections. We'll introduce that term a little later. So let's first define what an orthogonal basis is and after that we'll see a few examples of orthogonal bases. So this section is called orthogonal bases. And let's go right into the definition here. As usual, we need a vector space equipped with a scalar product, so a Euclidean vector space. We'll also make it finite dimensional to make the technicalities a little easier here. So let V be a Euclidean vector space. And we'll define the following. We first define what it means for a set to be orthogonal. That's as straightforward as you think it is. Um, if each pair of vectors in the set is orthogonal, then the set of vectors is also called orthogonal. So a set of vectors v1 to vk of any size of vectors in v, so a subset of v, is called orthogonal if the scalar product of vi and vj is zero for all i, j in one to k where i is not equal to j. So any two distinct vectors are perpendicular. That's an orthogonal set. We can make this notion a little stronger because for measurement purposes, we'd of course like to have vectors that have a simple measurement and then can be scaled arbitrarily so that we can actually have the right, see the right scaling vectors here. Um, so what often makes things a little easier is to have vectors that have a defined length of exactly one. And we call that property normal. So together with orthogonality, we call that orthonormal. And that's the next definition. So a set of k vectors in V is called orthonormal if it is orthogonal and the norm of all vectors vi is 1 for all i in 1 to k. And third, now we are ready to define what an orthogonal and especially an orthonormal basis is. That's just a basis that is also an orthogonal or orthonormal set. So a basis of V is called an orthogonal basis. if it is also an orthogonal set and an orthonormal basis or often just ONB 
as an abbreviation for orthonormal bases. If it is also an orthonormal set. And that's actually going to be the case we're interested in most. So usually if we look at orthogonal bases, we'll also normalize them. So we usually use orthonormal bases or arbitrary bases, right? Orthogonal, those bases do exist. And sometimes it's enough to have an orthogonal basis, but usually we won't bother and uh, we'll normalize them also. Let's have a look at a few examples of such bases. There's of course one easy example that you all know and love, and that is the canonical basis. So for example, in R2, this space is here, one, zero, zero, one. These vectors obviously have length one, and they are orthogonal to each other. So this is an orthonormal basis of R2. Right, so more general. The set U1 to UN, known as the canonical basis, is an O and B of R to the N. Of course, that's not the only possible example of an O and B, so we'll just stay in, in uh, R2. Let's say we have a look at this basis here, one, one, minus one, one, those are linearly independent vectors and they are orthogonal. So this is obviously an orthogonal basis of R2. But it's not an O and B because the length of those vectors is not one. As for example, the length of this vector here would be the square root of one plus one, so the square root of two, and this is not one. And the other one has the same length, right? So this is an orthogonal basis, but not an orthonormal basis. Quick sketch. So this basis is one, one, like this vector here, and minus one, one, this vector here. So this is an orthogonal basis here. And now, of course, we can make those vectors a little shorter to force them to have length one. Uh, and if we do this, we get an O and B, right? So we can just normalize that by dividing through the length. They both have length square root of two. So we just divide by one over square root of two. We scale by that factor. And then we get vectors that are orthogonal. and have length one, so this is an O and B. And of course, there's lots of other orthonormal bases of R2, and we we'll compute some in the exercises. There's one more thing I'd like to mention that is important about um, orthogonal vectors. There is an important connection to linear independence. If we have a set of orthogonal vectors, then this also means the vectors are automatically linearly independent. So if I can choose orthogonal vectors, then I get linear independence for free. And that means if I have an orthogonal basis, the proof that this is actually a basis is easy. I just need, if I know the dimension, I just need dimension many vectors that are orthogonal proving orthogonality is usually easy. It's just a matter of doing a few computations. And then I get linear independence for free. So once I have that, the rest is smooth sailing, hopefully. 
I'll summarize this in a theorem. Let's say we have a vector space, let V be a vector space with scalar product, so a Euclidean vector space. And let's say we have a set that is orthogonal. We call that set M. Say it consists of V1 to VK, a finite subset of V that does not contain the zero vector. That's the one thing that we have to take care of. So formally, of course, an orthogonal set could contain the zero vector not an orthonormal because it could not be normalized to one, but an orthogonal set could contain that and then it could not be linearly independent. So we have to exclude that case, no zero vector. So if that is an orthogonal set, then we know that M is also linearly independent. And as quick practice of how to work with scalar products and orthogonality, I'll give you the proof for that theorem. So we want to show that these vectors are linearly independent, and that means we have to prove that there is no linear combination of the zero vector with non-trivial coefficients. So let's say we have a linear combination of the zero vector, let lambda one to lambda k be the coefficients in R, such that the sum of the lambda i vi is the zero vector, i from one to k. We have to show that this necessarily implies that all the lambdas are zero. There cannot be another solution. We have to show that this implies lambda one equals lambda two and so on up to lambda k. All of these are equal to zero. To do so, let's choose an arbitrary vector in those, la in, in those v1 to vk. So choosing arbitrary, we'll call it j in 1 to k. So we have a look at the vector vj. And what we'll do is we look at the scalar product of a vj and the zero vector. And of course that is zero, right? Anything with a scalar product, any, anything with a zero vector is always zero. That's easy. And now we know the zero vector can be expressed as the linear combination of those vi's. So lambda i vi. Okay, we know that is zero. Now we're using bilinearity of the scalar product. We just keep the vj fixed and we use linearity of that second factor and we obtain, well, this is the same as the sum from one to k of lambda i vj, vi, that scalar product. And now finally, we know that the set M is orthogonal. That means the vi's are pairwise orthogonal. So each of these scalar products is zero with one exception, and that is i equals j. So the scalar product of vj with itself is of course not zero. So that's the only factor that remains. 
and we get this is the same as lambda j times the scalar product of vj with itself. Right? Or in other words, this is lambda, sorry, this is lambda j times the norm of vj squared. Now vj is not the zero vector. And that means the norm of vj is strictly positive by the definition of a norm, right? That has to be strictly positive. So what that means is if this factor here is strictly positive and the whole thing is zero, then the only reason for that is that lambda must be zero, lambda j, right? So what we have is zero equals lambda j times that norm. That norm here is positive. So the only possible consequence is lambda j is zero. And now the same argument works for every possible j from one to k. So we have shown that all the lambdas have to be zero. All right, so this argument works for every j in one to k. Thus, all the lambdas are zero, and that means our set M is indeed linearly independent. And that completes the proof. And that also completes this introduction into orthogonal and orthonormal bases. In the following videos, we're going to apply this concept to projections, to decompositions, and of course, we're also going to learn how to actually compute an orthonormal basis because normally you don't already have one. You have to come up with one if you need it. So there is a nice method to do this. And I'm sure I'll see you then.